Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. So my name is Luan, and I will be presenting to you this afternoon. I'm in Cape Town, South Africa, and it would be lovely to see where you are. So please say hello in the chat. Tell us where you are today. And in the meantime, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I've been a teacher for almost more than 13 years now. And during that time, I have taught students from all over the world, both abroad and here in South Africa. It's been quite a journey. So I also train teachers and I'm a Cambridge examiner. I'm busy, but I'm loving every second of it. So as mentioned, it would be lovely to see where you are from. I see Cynthia, hello. Where are you from today, Cynthia? And then I've also got Arash from Iran. I think I recognize your name from one of our previous webinars, welcome. Cass from South Africa too, nice to see you here today. All right, I see the names coming in. Robin, hello from South Africa too, nice to have you here. All right, we've also got Danielle and you are from the UK. It's nice to see you, hello Linda. And then we've got Pierre, is it Pierre Greenall from Ireland? Nice to have you. Judy, hello. Oh, from the Caribbean. We also, ah, Cynthia, thank you, from Spain. Welcome. And we have Renuka. Renuka, you're from the USA today. Still quite early there. <laughs> and we also have Leah. Leah from Canada. Ah, but you're from South Africa. All right, welcome. Welcome. It's lovely having you all here today. And um, yeah, let's get straight into it. So even if you pop in a little bit later, please let us know where you're from. It's just nice to see where everybody's sitting this afternoon, this morning, this evening. All right, so please note that we will most certainly have a Q&A section at the end of today's webcast. So if you think of any questions along the way, save them, write them down, and then later on during Q&A, please pop them into the chat. I will try to answer as many questions as I can, but also note that I will be answering questions related to today's topic only. So if you have questions that do not relate to the webinar today, we will most certainly try and help you. You can send tickets to tutor support and one of our tutor support managers will be more than happy to assist. All right, so let's see if any other names have come in. Yep, nice to have you all here today. All right, so let's get started. So today, as you know, it is all about writing, teaching writing. And teaching writing is a very interesting business because we're going to be looking at the dynamics of a writing class, what we do in that class, and so on. So let's have a look um, at what we're going to discuss today. And remember, as mentioned, you're more than welcome to ask questions later on. So as you can see, we'll be looking at what writing is in the context of TEFL. We'll also be looking at different stages of writing. We'll be looking at why we teach writing. Then something that is quite um, important, writing for freer practice of new target language. We'll be looking at different kinds of writing. And then also a brief look at how spoken English and written English differ. Also implications for teaching. And then finally, not finally, process writing and product writing. And then yes, finally, using a correction code. I see a few more names have come in. Hello, Nafisa from Iran and John from uh, Geneva, Switzerland. Welcome to the webinar today. All right, so let's get cracking. So the first thing we're going to look at is what is writing? So obviously the word writing has quite a broad meaning, covering both the ability to form letters with a pen or a pencil, that's handwriting. And at a higher level for your students to produce lengthy pieces of meaningful text. So while our main focus is on the latter today, we are going to briefly discuss that first aspect of writing. As you may find you were teaching adults who are illiterate in their own language or people who are not yet familiar with the Roman alphabet. 
With such students, the challenge for the teacher is much greater because you have to introduce students to the concept of visual symbols representing sounds and meaning. So if you do find yourself teaching students um, the concept of visual symbols representing sounds and meaning, yes, you'll need to start at the very beginning. And you'll actually have to show them how to form letters. They will need to have substantial practice of copying letters, words, and also punctuation. So if we talk about the stages of writing, we spoke about that copying stage first. And that's absolutely the very first stage. Think about it. If you're learning a new skill like this, that's that security you have in copying something down definitely grounds you in that skill and helps you in future tasks. But then, yes, the very next stage is to provide your students with guided writing tasks. And then, of course, stage three is to provide them with free writing tasks. So although teaching basic handwriting and, liter and literacy skills is not often required in EFL writing, please check our course materials and also our further reading sections for help on this. You might find yourself in this position where you might have to help someone from the very start, but we do not leave you in the deep end. We certainly help you out. So take a look at our further reading section. So it is important to remember that nowadays, most written texts are not handwritten, but are word processed on computers and texting is also another form of writing. So now that we've spoken about handwriting per se and how to form these letters and these strange symbols that your learners have to get used to, let's look at the writing of meaningful text. This is the bulk of our webinar today because this is the one that you'll most likely be involved with from a very early stage of your teaching career. So in the real world, people write for a purpose. But what does this mean? This means that we need to think about how we ensure students write meaningfully. Completing written grammar and vocabulary exercises, please note, while important, is not writing. Writing involves conveying information, opinions, and emotions, very importantly, to a reader. There's a message behind meaningful text. Why are they writing? All right. And something that we need to look at is why do we teach writing? So most of our learners want to learn to speak English. They want to learn to be able to recognize sounds in listening. But then why do we teach writing? Well, we start with the fact that very much it's students needs based. The primary reason for teaching students to write in English is that it is a useful skill, which most students are likely to need. But then we look at number two, reason number two, and that is a needs analysis. In other words, when our students write, it really helps us to see where the gaps are, where they need help. So teaching students to write in English rather than just speaking English helps the teacher to assess their progress and to identify problem areas or gaps, like I mentioned earlier, which need further development. So written work, which you can take away and study, is easier to analyze than spoken utterances in the classroom. And then reason three, confidence, good old confidence. If students work together to plan a piece of written work, it creates the need to communicate orally. So preparing to write can also improve speaking practice. And as teachers, no matter what other skill we are focusing on, we try to increase talking time for our students. And planning a piece of writing together can certainly do so. And then the final reason, well, there are many others, but the final core reason today, improving those reading skills. So in writing lessons, students look at model texts. I like to give my students a model text before I expect them to write something. So studying these model texts and thinking about how they are structured very often helps to develop those reading skills. All right. And then something that I really enjoy about writing is writing for freer practice of new target language. I want to throw that in there. So 
Imagine you've come to the end of a grammar or vocabulary lesson and you want your students to complete a free writing task to practice. The target language may be presented in that lesson. So a writing task is a great way to do that. Of course, as a teacher, I like to have them speak first, have them communicate with each other to practice the target language. But very often a writing task makes them really reflective on the target language and helps them practice maybe what they've learned either in that uh, former lesson or in one of the lessons prior to that lesson earlier in the week perhaps. So I'm going to show you a topic. Your students are going to be expected to write about this topic and I, want, I would like you to think about what target language do you think the teacher is trying to get out of that piece of writing. All right, so if you think of anything, please pop it in the chat and I'll see if any of your ideas are correct. And please be comfortable. It's not a matter of it's wrong or right. We're just having a little chat. So the very first topic, if I as a teacher ask my students to write about my first day at school, what vocabulary or grammar do you think the teacher is trying to get out of them? What do you think was maybe covered in an earlier lesson or that exact lesson? Let's see if we can get any ideas in the chat. If not, I will happily tell you. But let's see. My first day at school, what vocabulary, what grammar do you think the teacher is trying to get out of them? So if you don't want to share your ideas, just think it through, brainstorm with yourself, and then I'll give you the idea in a second. All right. So the target language that maybe the teacher is trying to get students to practice in that piece of writing could be absolutely, I think it's a pair, peregrino um, or pere, absolutely, vocabulary related to school, um, narrative tenses, and that's exactly it. Past tenses, simple past, absolutely Arash. So when you are giving them a topic like this, yes, that is possibly, Nafisa, you're spot on, what you want your students to practice. Absolutely. You're so on the right track. This tells me that you're ready for another one. Here you go. Another topic. Write about what you and your family usually did at celebrations when you were a child? What target language do you think? Now, don't only think in terms of grammar, think in terms of vocabulary too. Any ideas? So you and your family, there's a little, little clue, usually did at celebrations, another little clue maybe for vocabulary, and then when you were a child, absolutely tells us what kind of grammar is the teacher trying to get here. It could be, yes, John, exactly. If you think about little celebrations and traditions, games could ab absolutely be part of it. Um, simple past again, because when you were a child, I like these ideas coming through. Let me show you. So maybe the teacher is trying to get them in that piece of writing to exercise vocabulary related, ah, Karim, spot on, the vocabulary related to family, traditions, celebrations. And then those narrative tenses, yes, John, past continuous, uh, past simple, and then absolutely structures like used to. Vocab for celebrations, yes, yes, yes. Uh, but yes, used to, because think about it, when we celebrate, you know, think about celebrations in the past, it might be things that we did in the past that we no longer do now, and then used to would ab absolutely be one of those structures to practice. All right, I think you're ready for another one. My plans for the future. What do you think the target language is here? I like all these ideas, so please feel comfortable to pop them in. My plans for the future. This could be for an adult group. It could be for a, a group of teenagers. It could even be for a group of young children. Because remember, the future, quite broad, can be my very next weekend. It can be plans for after school. It can be plans for my studies. All right. So let me give you a few ideas here. Future forms. 
your tenses, vocabulary related to the context of your lesson. So if you've taught, uh, if you, uh, the context of your lesson is future careers, then you might have some vocabulary about that or upcoming weekend activities for those slightly lower levels. Going to and will, absolutely. Especially going to, don't you think? Because going to is all about plans. Going to plus that verb, definitely talking about plans. Future tenses, I see that coming through. Present continuous for the future, absolutely, especially for those arrangements. Holiday vocabulary, absolutely. Desires, goals, John, I like it, exactly. Especially with your older groups, your adult groups that have got these goals and plans and aims, absolutely. All right, I think you're ready for one more. How to cook my favorite dish. So please feel free from the get-go to start putting your ideas into the chat. How to cook my favorite dish. What do you think the target language is here? Any ideas? You've been right so far, so feel brave. All right, going to give you a few ideas and then yes, we'll see more of those coming in. So it could be vocabulary related to food, to measurements, to ingredients, and then imperative. There we go, Cass, writing simple instructions. Absolutely, because writing simple instructions, the language there would be imperatives. So spot on. And then John, yes, food. And I, you know what? I didn't think about that. Kitchen utensils. Did not think about that. Arash, absolutely ingredients. So you're all completely spot on. All right, thank you for all those ideas. They are amazing and all of them were absolutely spot on. So now we're going to look at different types of writing. Now, writing doesn't only involve, you know, writing a letter. There are other kinds of writing. Can you think of any? I'm going to continue, but as you think of any, again, feel free to pop them in the chat. I love getting all your ideas. So off the top of my head, if I were to think about different kinds of writing, just to get you started, a very simple shopping list. What about text messages? Think about your adults who start filling in forms. I mean, as adults, that's all, you know, that's all we do. So filling in forms, a very important part of writing. Um, emails, personal emails, work-related emails, all different. Yeah, and then we've also got ideas about formal versus informal. Absolutely. Newsletters. Yes, Shelton. I have a feeling you receive a few of those. Uh, and then I've got writing short stories. Yes, I love writing short stories. So I love giving those to my students because it gets to practice all those narrative tenses. All right. Poetry, yes, absolutely. So let's have a few, let's have a look at a few of these ideas and you'll see that lots of what you've said, they're actually right there. Karim, yes, articles, absolutely. Right, so we've got shopping lists, like I said, text messages, those forms, emails, reports. Think about it, at work, they might have to submit a report to um, a manager. Then you've got letters. And they can be informal. Yes, you can be writing a letter to a friend, but also letters of application. You know, when you apply for a job, those um, letters of motivation. You know, if you're not happy with something, a letter of complaint. I see more coming through. Reviews, yes, postcards. And you'll see on the very next slide, there they are. So we've got postcards, messages in greeting cards. Those of your students who are maybe doing a business course might have to deliver a presentation. So writing that, writing memos at work, absolutely. And then also maybe even writing a small advertisement. You know, if you're putting your flat up for rent or for sale, you know, you might have to write a little advertisement about that. I love all your ideas and you are 100% spot on. All right, uh, we've even got more. <laughs> a telephone message, an essay, whether it be a creative essay or a discursive essay, that's in there too. And then a diary entry. Think about that. A lot of your students, in fact, for my son, he's 13, to improve his language skills, he's got to write a diary entry every day, a to-do list, business correspondence. And then I think one of you mentioned poetry earlier, 
there it is. I also see professional reference coming through CVs. Yes, absolutely. And John, I would almost do a CV and a motivation letter in a back-to-back -back lesson. I like that, making payments, yes. All right, so when it comes to writing, and comparing it with spoken language, yes, there is a difference. So if you think about it, written English is a lot more organized. Students have time to think about what they want to express, whether, you know, whereas spoken English is sometimes a bit more spontaneous. They don't have time to process and think about something before they deliver. Now, we need to look at how we achieve this kind of organization in written language. Now, this is quite a lengthy list, so I'm gonna go through it relatively quickly, but I think it'll make sense to you because the one sort of flows from one idea to the next. So, they have their ideas, and their ideas are organized into sentences. The sentences are then organized logically into paragraphs according to the topic. Paragraphs are organized into a whole cohesive text. They get to use conjunctions and referencing. They also get to use more complex, uh, complex grammatical structures. Um, there's a more careful choice um, and a greater variety of vocabulary and structure. And there are also, you know, irrelevant digressions that are, that are avoided that can very often happen when we speak. You know, when my students have got to deliver something verbal in class, they very often go off. Um, with writing, there's a bit more consideration and a bit more anchoring, and they tend to go off topic a little less in writing. And then, yes, writing conventions are employed, like spelling and punctuation and layout conventions. Now, punctuation, believe it or not, even our first language speakers are struggling with punctuation. So think about your students and how much they need to focus on something like that. So writing definitely helps them to organize those ideas. All right, so now we need to think about the implications for teaching. So we can help our students improve the quality of their writing by including vocabulary revision and also introducing new vocabulary in our writing lessons. Please note that new vocabulary should not be introduced right on top of the writing task itself, but somewhere prior to the writing task in the actual lesson or in a former lesson. So not only will their essays and whatever they're writing be a lot more interesting and varied if they use a wide range of vocabulary, or well, the process of writing will also provide freer practice of whatever target language and help them learn it. We spoke about that a little bit earlier. Also, we need to encourage students to use various cohesive devices. This builds confidence and it also makes their language a lot more colorful and creative and accurate. And then also, just as we would not ask students to sit down and silently read long texts in the classroom, it is not a very good use of class time to get students to actually do written assignments during lessons. I know it's tempting because it gives you a bit of time as a teacher to do planning or something that you might want to get done, but your students will not see it that way. So writing lessons, therefore, usually focus on the process of constructing a piece of writing. Students plan their written work in class, maybe alone, maybe in pairs, maybe in groups, but here's the big one. They do the actual writing for homework. So this is something quite important to me as a teacher, but also as someone who receives assignments. And very often, a lot of our, our course participants plan wonderful writing tasks, but the mistake they make is to give the writing task in class and also have students complete the written work in class. Give writing as homework. I hope that's clear. All right. So, the very next thing we're going to look at is also qu something quite interesting, and it's the difference between process and product writing. I'm sure those of you who have started the online course and have actually ventured into this unit, you've seen these two terms, and you might be wondering, what is the key difference? 
So when it comes to pro to writing, yes, there are these two approaches. And we've got to think about the fact that writing in any language is complex, from the language required to the conventions of the particular genre. This means that students need guidance and feedback. So like I said, these two main approaches are product writing and process writing. The first one we're going to look at is process writing. Right, so process writing. It's better to do a whole lesson about writing than just to smack it at the end of a lesson. We can absolutely give a written task at the end of the lesson, yes. But think about the fact that they need a lot of work, a lot of groundwork before they can produce a piece of writing. So with process writing, the focus should be on how to put together a piece of writing rather than the writing itself, if that makes any sense. This is why writing lessons usually focus on the process of constructing a piece of writing. Students plan their written work in class, but they do the actual writing for homework process writing. The emphasis is, is, on, is more, sorry, on the collaboration and the creativity of the process itself. So let's look a bit at product writing and probably once we go through this, it'll be easier. And remember, this is all in our course material. So if you're still a little iffy afterwards, you can certainly have a look. So product writing. The product approach focuses on writing tasks in which you, the learners imitate or copy and transform a model that the teacher has given them. So like I said to you earlier, I believe that when you ask your students to write an essay, you've got to give them an example of an essay before they get started. If you want them to write a blog, give them one that you've written. Please note that it's got to be graded for their level. If they are B1 students, you cannot give them a model with C1 or C2 language got to be graded. But the important thing here is that a model is given and they analyze what the model consists of. For example, think about a postcard, format, level of formality, useful language to include in a postcard, linking expressions, and they work together to produce a type, a piece of writing of the same type. Now, this is the kind of writing I would maybe give in class time, because as mentioned, they work together to produce the piece of writing. So you could get away with actually getting them to write in class if you do product writing. All right. Okay, and the very next thing we're going to look at, now this is something that changed my life as a teacher. So it is using a correction code. Now a correction code is, I think back to when you were at school and you delivered a piece of writing, maybe in English, maybe in another language, and the teacher starts to mark things in red pen. All your mistakes highlighted in ghastly red pen. All right, those days are gone with a correction code. All right, so as teachers, we're trying to help students to make progress in English. When they get feedback on their work, they want an indication of how well they have done and what areas, this is important, they need to work on. So often teachers are presented with a piece of writing from a student and believe me, they don't know where to begin with corrections. Um, so to be fair, we don't want to overload with red pen, but we want our students to understand their mistakes and where they've gone wrong. So how do we do it? Do you remember that red pen I spoke about earlier? <laughs> yeah, red pen, yes or no? I will say no. Step one, put down the red pen teachers. I've got nothing against red. It's one of my favorite colors, but not on paper when correcting students. So before you begin underlining mistakes and adding in corrections and practically rewriting that piece of writing for your students, think about what your aim for the corrections is going to be. You cannot correct every mistake in all pieces of writing. So consider whether you want to correct maybe the spelling or the sentence construction, or grammatical accuracy, or specific linking devices. 
So say, for example, you taught your students adjectives for the week and you want them to write um, about an experience using at least 10 of the adjectives they've learned. Well, you need to make it very clear that when you're marking the work, you're not going to point out every error. You're going to focus mostly on the adjectives they've included and whether they've included those adjectives correctly. So it's very important to convey this to your students so that they don't assume that what hasn't been marked in red or another color is correct necessarily. So make that very, very clear. Also, what happens is when you start correcting just a particular point in their writing, it clarifies it for the students and it means fewer corrections for you and less red ink for your learners. I will tell you a correction code cuts your marking time, for me personally, in half. Before it would take, you know, this amount of time to mark something, using a correction code, maybe half that. It will change your life. All right, the second thing is to establish that code in your classroom. Your learners need to know what the symbols on that code represent so that you don't need to spell it out for them every single time. You can use an existing correction code. You can find one in our course material. You can find one online. So find one and establish it in class. What I like to do is I like to actually print it super large. I put it on the wall. When they receive back a piece of writing and they see WW under a particular word, sometimes they forget. So they look at the correction code and they will see that WW stands for wrong word. And they'll know, okay, I've used the wrong word here. Maybe I'll have something underlined with SP. They'll check on the code and they'll see, ah, oh, SP stands for spelling. I've spelled this word incorrectly. Maybe WF, word form. So they'll know, okay, the word is correct here, but the form of the word I'm using is not correct. So if they say something like, she danced beautiful, and I underline that and I say word form, WF, then they know, okay, beautiful's the problem here. The correct word, so to speak, but the form needs to be addressed. And what this also does is that it gives your learners autonomy. They get to self-correct. They get to look up what they think they did wrong and they correct it themselves. Yes, they will come to you and they'll just ask for confirmation, but that's all right. It gets them self-correcting and what that does, think about it, if you get to correct your own errors, you tend to remember those and you tend to not make those mistakes second or third time round. Might take a little longer than that, but it gets the ball rolling. So there are numerous correction codes available that you can use to mark your students' work Decide which one you are going to use and be consistent with it so that your students become familiar with it. Using a correction code will help you cut your marking down, your marking time down substantially. I've mentioned this earlier, but I'm mentioning it again because this happened for me. And like I said, to summarize, remember that you do not need to provide corrections for all the mistakes, but rather point out where the error is and the nature of the error your students should be able to do the correction themselves. So I hope that this webinar has been helpful and that it has made you aware of what writing in the TEFL classroom entails. So now it is your time to ask questions. Um, remember to type your questions in the chat function and I of course will answer as many as possible. All right. Any questions? So I had a comment earlier that I'd actually like to address, but I would maybe just need you to clarify a little bit. Um, Shelton, you actually said, would this not demotivate or, or, or cause students to feel a little bit unmotivated? Um, Shelton, I would love to clarify that for you. So if you could just tell me exactly what you're referring to, I'll be more than happy to answer. And then I'm sorry, I also saw another question earlier. Would this be group work? Um, if you could just clarify that for me. All right. Would, yes. So Shelton, you asked about, um, let's see, would product, 
All right. So as mentioned earlier, if you're doing product writing, yes, you can absolutely do this in class because it involves your learners working together, analyzing a model, looking at the kind of language, maybe giving the one group this paragraph to write, the other one that paragraph and get them to write. This is normally done in class, but it can absolutely be done as homework also. Um, and it's a nice exercise because, Shelton, what it does Yes, you're at, 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 sorry, you're exercising the writing skill, but your learners are also getting to communicate. So this would absolutely um, be beneficial to them. All right. All right. And then I've got um, a question from Renuka. From what level, and this is such a good question, because as when I was a new teacher, I also thought about this. I thought, new students you know they can hardly they can hardly maybe put two words together at a one level and i'm asking them to write so renuka you get to know your students and you'll get to see what they can produce after being with you for a little while so you could maybe start with a shopping list if you've taught them some food vocabulary tell them okay i want you to write a shopping list of about six things Group A, you're making a salad. Group B, you are making this. Group C, and then you can get them to write. Um, so, Renuka, I would say that you can absolutely include writing at lower levels, but I would not be too ambitious with the kind of writing I expect from my students. All right. And then, Judy, thank you. I'm happy. <laughs> I'm happy you thought the class was excellent. Please ask questions if you've got any. All right. And then, ah, okay, uh, let's see. Thank you, Nafisa, that's lovely to see. Um, and then, I, uh, Shelton, I think you did clarify, and I'd like to address that, absolutely. Would homework demotivate them when we, when we don't do it in class? So, like, are you asking if I allocate homework, does it, um, you know, demotivate or get students a little unmotivated? No, not at all. Um, Again, I will say, I'm going to admit, I am not pro homework. I don't like giving homework. I don't like it when my 13 year old comes home with homework, but I do see the benefit of constructing a writing piece in class and then letting them write in their own time. So you know what I do, Shelton? I would maybe allocate the writing almost a week before the deadline so that they've got a little bit of time to write it on a daily basis to build on that and then I would have them submit, submit at the end of the week and then give yourself enough time to mark, um, tell them within a week they'll get it back and then use that correction code to mark. I hope that helps. Um, Cordelia, let's see, I like this question. With product writing, won't it make learners feel pressured to meet the teacher's level of the writing activity? Again, Cordelia, you grade your tasks. Keep your tasks suitable for the level of your students. And also, when you provide them with a model, um, a model text. Make sure that that model text includes language at their level that they are comfortable with so that when they produce something, it actually looks a little bit similar to that model. It's not copying. It's not cheating. It's just giving them that security of um, producing a written piece. As a student, think about it, I tried to learn Italian and when my student, when my teacher gave me a topic and said, write a little something, you know, yes, there was a model, we worked together. I actually built the written piece and felt like a superstar, loaded with mistakes, I'll tell you, Found like a, felt like a superstar when she gave it back to me, marked it, and I actually produced something at the end of the day. So it's definitely a nice task um, and not something you have to be concerned about. As long as you keep your tasks graded, the model that you provide them, keep it realistic and graded for them so that your learners feel accomplished that they've put something together, never mind all the errors. All right. I hope that answers your question. Cass, um, let's see. So if students are not familiar with the Roman alphabet, how would you go about teaching it? So Cass, slowly, carefully, 
and with lots and lots of patients. I had three students coming from another country and I they were put into my beginner class. And I thought, okay, I'm going to start with some nice basic English. Well, Cass, surprise, surprise, I had to start with the alphabet. So we looked at the alphabet. We started with the letters, then we started with the sounds. Then we started putting those letters together and looking at the results of those sounds. Cass, I will tell you that it is very rare that you will have students who, who know the alphabet and can speak a basic level of English and students who do not know the Roman alphabet in one class. It's very rare. Most language schools will separate and you'll have what we call real beginners and you'll have false beginners. A real beginner might have to start with the alphabet and that's where you start. Whereas a, um, a false beginner knows the alphabet even knows a little bit of English. So that's the difference. And I would say, Cass, in most cases, they are separated. All right, I hope that helps. I've got another great question. I love your questions today. So what is the best way of correcting homework besides students correcting each other? Because it's very time consuming. Arash, this is one of those challenges we have as teachers is that we actually have to correct writing. So you know what I do? I totally cheat. I do not give a piece of writing every single week. Writing is something that I don't do regularly, but when I do it, I use that correction code and it really helps. Sometimes you can get them to peer correct. That's absolutely an option, but um, sorry, Arash, the correction code removes that whole time consuming aspect from marking. Please try it. As mentioned, it cut my marking time in half. All right. All right, this is a lovely question um, because this is a challenge a lot of teachers face is how do we keep students interested when practicing or when doing a writing class? Well, Shelton, if you think about it, it should really model any other class. You should have a warmer to engage them. You should have a section where you're looking at new phrases and target language. So now they're engaged because the warmer is a topic that they're that's relatable for them. Then you've got a, maybe teaching of new vocabulary and your learners love learning new vocabulary. So then you'll have that section, for example. Then you'll have the section where they are putting something together, maybe collaborating. Um, then you'll have maybe if it's product writing, going off into various parts of the classroom and working on that piece of writing, then producing it at the end of the day and maybe responding verbally to the text that another group has written. So believe me, Shelton, You've got so many other skills at practice here that a writing class is very rarely a boring class. Also, if you're giving the writing as homework, again, they have built something in class. They have brainstormed language. They've learned new phrases that they would like to incorporate into that piece of writing. So believe me, there are so many steps and so many other creative outlets um, when, for example, they are uh, writing. So absolutely not a boring lesson. All right, so I've got a question from Linda. Would you use peer review of written tasks with A1 or A2 students? Or should this be reserved for B and C level students? Now, I will say that I am not tempted to give a very low level class peer correction. If it is a super simple piece of writing, where they've maybe had to construct a few present simple sentences. Okay, maybe I would, but I think that error correction at that level is so daunting. It's daunting at almost any level. So I would say that again, depending on the task, depending on the strength of your class and depending on how limited, um, the if you're just looking for present simple mistakes, then maybe I would let them work in pairs and just kind of compare their work and see if they can spot anything. But I would say in most cases, then I would do the correcting and just experiment little by little. And again, task dependent, but great question. Thank you. All right, so Nafisa, I don't know if you heard, um, there was another question earlier about how to keep students interested 
during a writing lesson. You can absolutely do that because again, a writing lesson is not just like, okay, now you're going to write something, off you go. There's, there's a, there are stages um, and these stages exercise various other skills. As I mentioned, every lesson should have a warmer. I'm, I'm key in that every lesson should have a warmer. So something to engage them. Learning new phrases, again, exciting for your students. Putting those phrases into accuracy exercises and then at the end of the day, working together, perhaps in product writing to produce something or going home and leisurely writing something in a process writing class, I would absolutely say will keep them engaged and interested. Also, they really want your feedback. Believe me, I've had students standing at my door at the end of classes, teacher, you correct my work yet? No, I haven't. They want that feedback. So believe me, they are engaged from start to finish. That's in my experience. And not only as an experienced teacher, this has been the experience from the start, but great question. All right, um, let's see. All right, important question. All your questions are important, but just to be fair and answer a few of everybody's, I'd like to look at Cordelia's question. How do you create how do you create the writing limit? Like the minimum and maximum of words? Absolutely. Okay, so again, A1 learners, you're not going to ask them to write a 500 word essay. Absolutely not. You're going to maybe ask them to draw up a little shopping list or you know, write about the first day at school if they've done past tenses and have them include so you keep it really limited and short at your lower levels but this is the important thing please allocate a word limit you have students who will write three words for you and i don't know how you are meant to grade that and then you'll have students that will write five thousand words and you have to mark that so think about it arash you asked me earlier to you know, it's it's tedious and time consuming to mark. So imagine if you don't set a word limit and your students write a 900 word essay, set a time limit. Oh, not a, sorry, not a time limit, a word limit. So if that you want them to write a movie review, tell them 200 words. If you want them to write a discursive essay and they're a high level class like C1, 500 words. But again, do not let them write a 500 word essay in class, give it to them as homework. If you have an exam preparation class, like the Cambridge CAE group, they're advanced students, it's all about timing. So occasionally you would have to give them a writing piece in class and time it, maybe 500 words, 45 minutes. But this is crunch time for them, it's an exam course. So I would say that's the only time I would give a lengthy piece like that inside the lesson when in fact they've got to work on timing skills because they're writing a big exam in say 12 weeks or so. But please teachers to all of you include a word limit. This is imperative. All right. And then I've got another question here. How would you encourage students to write descriptive paragraphs or essays? Karim, great question. Now, this is what I find important, not only in writing to encourage them to write, but also in any lesson is to make the topic of your lesson relatable. If you've got a bunch of 14 year olds and you want them to write about a fun experience they've had tell them it's got to be something fun you did you can write about what you did with the friend make it relatable for them if you're looking at a bunch of adult students the topic has got to be relatable and this is a huge part of encouraging them to write if i think about it for yourself kareem if you've got to write about a topic that you are just not interested in at all you're not very motivated and you're not going to give your best work. So make sure that the context of your lesson and also the topic of your writing is relatable. Talk to your students before, see what their interests are. Are they interested in writing a movie review? Because if they're not, give them something else to do. Make sure that the topic is relatable and based on a needs analysis, whether it's something they actually want to do. All right, 
And then I've got another question. Cass, at what, sta at what stage would you recommend introducing creative writing using the target language? I think this was quite similar to Linda's um, question earlier and another question, but I don't mind repeating because this is something that even I had to get used to as a new teacher. So when it comes to your very low levels, remember, it's something difficult for them to write creatively. So I would say at the very low levels, keep it simple. As they start learning, Cass, those narrative tenses, their past tenses, their past continuous tenses, okay, have them write about a little experience they had last week or the weekend. Um, then when you do correct it, make sure that you point out that you are looking mostly at their past tenses. If, for example, you know at a lower level that they've learned those new future terms like will um, and maybe going to at a slightly higher level, Tell them, okay, write about something you want to do this coming weekend, and I'd like you to use will and going to where you can. So as you can see, it is very limited at the very low level. So Cass, what you need to do is be on top of what your learners are learning, what they have learned at that point, and then see what kind of topics and writing tasks you can give them at that stage. It's all about being in tune with what your learners know, what they need and what they can produce in writing. And I'll tell you what, learners like writing. I know this sounds bizarre, but they do. And the reason they do is because they don't always have the opportunity to speak in class necessarily because there are other students that are maybe more communi communicative than them, you know, monopolizing speaking time. So writing work is often very much a reflection task for a lot of your students. Um, and they actually enjoy the process quite a lot. Um, so I would say as soon as you can, Cass, if you see that they've got in their um, repertoire a few nice narrative tenses, get them writing ASAP. But keep it short, keep it simple, because remember, you have to mark it. All right, are there any other questions? Please. Um, okay, I've got another question here from... And then Shelton, I just saw yours now. I'm gonna jump right back to your question as well. But Cordelia, is it better to give multiple topics for learners to choose from, to pique every learner's interest or to keep the options of topics to one, one or two? Um, so that when you prepare the vocabulary that they are meant to use in those in those um, written pieces, you know, it's something that you could have spent time on in a lesson. Because if you give them a wide variety of topics, remember that's a wide variety of vocabulary topics too. So I would say, you know, based on the vocabulary you've done or the grammatical structures you've done, maybe give them an option of one or two topics. Also makes it easier for you to mark. All right. And then let me see, would sentence construction work better for lower levels? Um, Shelton, remember, doing grammar exercises and vocabulary exercises doesn't quite qualify, qualify, cauliflower, qualify as writing in TEFL. But um, you can absolutely keep writing tasks quite simple. So you could say to your A1 students, I want you to write a few sentences about what you do every day from the morning to the evening and use the present simple way you can. So that would absolutely be quite sentence construction based, but also give them a little bit of freedom with the target language. That's a great question, Shelton, thank you. Uh, let's see, Renuka, another question from you. Should you discuss the topic for the writing class or just topic, yes. Um, because remember, Renuka, you want them to kind of breathe out and relax into the topic. It mustn't be sort of pop quiz at the end of a lesson, right, now you're going to write something. So you absolutely set the context of your lesson. You go through the vocabulary, keep it in that topic, topic, context, same thing. And then at the end of the process, tell them, right, now you're going to write something together um, and you're going to use some of the phrases and the topic that you're writing about relates to the topic we spoke about earlier. So you can absolutely keep it in topic. I always think that topic being maintained right through the lesson is like a security blanket for students. And why not give them that security? Think about it. If you're nervous or if you don't know what's coming, 
you don't produce very well. It's the same with our students. So keeping that topic going throughout really gives them that security blanket and helps them produce the best English that they can. All right, ah, I love this. Um, thank you. Um, I'm happy that you found it informative and helpful because you know we, we're working with people who want to learn from us. So it is important to um, yeah, be enthusiastic and passionate about teaching. I am Jordan and it's a wonderful experience. No two days are the same. All right, and then I've got a great question here. Um, how could you help to make writing more challenging to more adventurous learners? Well, you know what, Cordelia, they kind of take the reins on this one and they dazzle you with a few vocabulary items and structures that you didn't even ask for. So I would say that, you know, you set the basis, you set the foundation, you give them the topic, they know what the expectation is. And if they exceed that expe expectation, we'll give, give them the praise that they deserve. But definitely don't set that as the bar because you remember, you're teaching a, a, a particular level. So they've got to feel that the task is achievable. If, however, they do dazzle you and they give you more than what you asked for vocabulary-wise or grammar-wise, absolutely comment on that and give them the praise they deserve for that piece. All right. Any other questions? All right, so it looks like we've come to the end of our webinar. I really do hope you found it useful. Um, but you know what? I'm going to squeeze in one more question. <laughs> would you focus on the grammar and punctuation for lower level students or would you mainly focus on the vocabulary? Shelton, it depends on what the lesson was about, what you've taught them. If you focused on vocabulary during the lesson, then in the writing, yes, focus more on the uh, on that when you mark. If you have focused on a grammatical structure for the week and you want them really to practice that in the writing, I would say focus on that. So it just depends what your angle is, but do make them aware that before they write, I'm going to be looking at your use of the past simple or the past tense, and I'm going to be looking at some of the vocabulary you learned during the week. Those expectations must be crystal clear. All right. I think that's all we've got time for today. It's been wonderful being with you. I do have a survey for you to complete. So I'd like to thank you for your participation. And um, yeah, please, please, please fill in the survey. It helps us see where we can improve these webinars. I'm going to pop that into the chat. Thank you for all the lovely compliments. I'm very happy you have found this useful. And I'm also going to be, yeah, let's just see, whoops. No, no more Q&A. <laughs> All right. There is the survey too, the survey link for the webinar. It's been wonderful being with all of you today. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. If you're already teaching, take a break and get started on Monday. Have a great weekend, everyone.